Hi, in this video, we're going to talk about fibrous and cartilaginous joints. So types of each of those. Uh, so fibrous joints, we have three types of fibrous joints and two types of cartilaginous joints. So the first type of fibrous joint is a suture. Uh, we only have these between the cranial bones of the skull. Uh, they're joined by a thin layer of dense, irregular connective tissue. So hopefully you already watched the arthrology lecture, um, and I talked a lot about what dense, irregular connective tissue is there. Um, so sutures are connected by dense, irregular connective tissue. Um, they're very strong, but very rare. We only have them between the cranial bones of the skull. Um, they are amphiarthrotic, so slightly movable in children, on uh, in infants and children. And then as we grow and our heads don't need to continue to expand, they eventually completely fuse together and become synarthrotic, so immovable. Um, now, some might debate whether they're ever truly immovable, uh, like someone who does craniosacral therapy or uh, some chiropractors, you know, certain professions um, count on the fact that the plates of the skull are still slightly movable and that's part of what they work with in their therapies. So anatomically, we say that it becomes synarthrotic, uh, but I'll just say that not everyone agrees with that and that that is kind of debatable. It may stay amphiarthrotic throughout life, but maybe just less so uh, once we're finished growing and developing. Okay, our second type is a syndesmosis or a syndesmotic joint. Uh, that's where we have two or more bones joined by ligaments. So again, bundles of collagen all going in the same direction. Uh, these are amphiarthrotic, so they allow a slight amount of movement. Um, and a good example of this is our distal tibiofibular joint. So where the tibia and fibula articulate all the way down at the ankle, uh, you may have heard of a high ankle sprain. Uh, well, this is the joint that is sprained when someone has a high ankle sprain. Um, so when we talk about the actions of the ankle, so we talk about... Um, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, combinations of those things. Um, those are all happening in our freely movable joints. That's all happening in the synovial joints of the ankle. So that's like uh, the telocoral joint and the subtalar joint. Um, but the whole ankle complex includes three joints, those two and our distal tibiofibular joint. Um, but of the three, the distal tibiofibular is a fibrous joint, so it is not responsible for any of the um, movements that we discuss being movements of the ankle. Because it's an amphiarthrotic joint, it's not a diarthrotic joint. Okay, so it's there to allow a slight amount of movement as the fibula and tibia move relative to one another, um, but it's not doing any of the plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, eversion. Okay, our third category of fibrous joints is an interosseous membrane. Uh, we have these in two places. One is between the radius and ulna in the forearm, and the other is between the tibia and fibula in the lower leg. Um, it's a sheet of dense, irregular connective tissue, just like we talked about previously, uh, between neighboring long bones, really just in those two locations, and it's amphiarthrotic, so it's allowing a slight bit of movement. Um, so we talk about, you know, pronation and supination of the forearm, where we're doing this at the forearm. That is diarthrotic movement. That is free movement. That is actually uh, movement of the superior and inferior radio ulnar joints. So at the elbow and at the wrist. Um, so that's that rotation happening um, in those two synovial joints. And then the interosseous membrane in between those two synovial joints, between these two bones, is just allowing for movement of those bones as that pronation and supination takes place at those two synovial joints. So I hope that that makes sense. Um, pronation and supination is not an action of the interosseous membrane. The interosseous membrane is simply there uh, to help 
make the forearm more strong and resistant to axial loading. And what I mean by that is like, if I put my hand on the ground and put my body weight on it, that's axial loading where I'm putting force um, down the length of the bones. And if not for the interosseous membrane, when I put force through the length of the bones, they would pop apart. So the interosseous membrane helps hold them together to help it be resistive to that axial loading force through the wrist. And same for the lower leg too. Same idea with the fibula and tib fib <laughs> tibia and fibula. There we go. All right, then we have two categories of cartilaginous joints. Again, defined just by the fact that they're joined together by cartilage. Uh, this first one is really odd um, and very rare. So it's called a synchondrosis. It's connected by hyaline cartilage, like I mentioned in our bone recording, or our bone lecture. Uh, hyaline cartilage is a type of very smooth cartilage. It's kind of bluish and um, so synchondrosis, connected by hyaline cartilage. There's no movement there, synarthrotic. And the best example in the body is the epiphyseal plate. Okay, so as hopefully you recall, the epiphyseal plate is a plate of cartilage um, that is in the metaphysis of the bone between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Uh, it's where the growing is happening in a growing bone. Um, and so that technically, even though it's within a bone, is technically considered a cartilaginous joint where we have a joining between the diaphysis and epiphysis of that bone. Uh, so it's only in growing bones, so adults wouldn't have any of these. So kind of a weird one. I wish it wasn't technically considered a joint, but it is. All right, and then our second one, we have many of these, is a symphysis. Um, so it's a joint that's connected by a flat disc of fibrocartilage. A uh, good example is like in our picture here, that is the pubic symphysis. Uh, so uh, symphysis joints are amphiarthrotic. They do allow some amount of movement. Uh, the pubic symphysis uh, allows movement during walking. So there's always gonna be just kind of a little tiny bit of, of give in that joint um, to allow the pelvis to have a certain amount of movement um, during weight bearing and, and walking. And then it's, there's a lot of, of movement and expansion there uh, during pregnancy and childbirth. Um, that's part of what the, the hormone relaxin does in pregnancy is allows for more flexibility of connective tissues and especially the pubic symphysis so that it can expand to allow for childbirth. Um, but there is still movement in the pubic symphysis in both males and females outside of just pregnancy and childbirth. Another good example of symphysis joints are um, all the intervertebral joints where every pair of vertebrae has a, a disc in between. Each one of those is a symphysis joint. Um, every place where there's a disc holding a vertebra superior to a vertebra inferior, each one of those is its own symphysis joint. Um, we'll get into those into more detail later on when we talk more about the spine. All right, well, that is all I have for you with this one, and I'll see you in the next video.